So I wanted to take the time today to talk a little bit about uh, lessons learned scaling Airbnb. Uh, I spent a little over six years there uh, as director of product and I wanted to walk you through that experience. So first, a little bit about, about me. Right now, I'm a partner at NEA. Uh, ben Nairson was up on the stage here earlier as well, who's a partner at, at NEA. And we invest in a variety of different types of startups, uh, roughly 20 billion in capital, currently working out of roughly a $3 billion fund. Uh, I focus on marketplaces and a handful of different types of businesses. Uh, previously to NEA, uh, I was at Airbnb, and, and I also worked at Dropbox and HubSpot, and prior to that, I was in venture a little over nine or 10 years ago. So marketplaces, as you may know, are notoriously hard to start. Uh, when I got to Airbnb, I was roughly the 35th employee. I was the first uh, product manager. They uh, had the core product experience working. It was actually uh, working in uh, uh, New York City. Uh, that was uh, a huge part of the business. It was roughly 30 to 40% percent of the business at that time. And we had roughly 10,000 listings. So I want to just give you kind of some sense uh, of the scale. Uh, I think yesterday or today, they just announced their 500 millionth guest. Uh, but the, the metric I always try to track is listings. And so the last number I heard a couple of years ago was roughly uh, 4 million listings. Uh, so though I do say that, that uh, it was scaling at 100x, uh, I could also claim it was 400x, but I'm being conservative at, at 100x. And so uh, at that time, it was also shifting from an early adopter product, which was a, a lot of times actually air mattresses, to being the global accommodations platform it is today. Uh, and I quickly realized that I was really part of a, a creative and a scrappy team. And that's really how we got through a lot of the inflection points that I'm going to talk about here. Uh, so the five biggest lessons learned scaling Airbnb were, uh, number one, setting super specific goals. And we're going to walk through that. Taking risks to service your community moving fast against our competition when it comes, and it came really fast for Airbnb, uh, understanding your edge cases, uh, and don't rest when the fires are out. So lesson one, uh, when jumpstarting a marketplace, set super specific goals. Uh, every marketplace uh, has a magic number, uh, particularly on the supply side, where it can take off. Uh, and for Airbnb, uh, we did a lot of work, and we actually realized that that was roughly 300 listings with 100 reviewed listings. And you may wonder, well, why is that the case? Uh, well, the reality is, think about the use case for the demand side. Uh, it's with that number of listings, with those numbers reviewed, a guest with a specific date range can actually go to a specific region and find a handful of listings, some of them social proofed, that actually get them what they want. If we dip below that number, the uh, uh, likelihood that they were going to transact fell. If we actually exceeded that number, you really saw a, a tremendous amount of growth in the business. And so what we really tried to do was actually get every market to that scale. So these were the clear steps we took. Uh, we basically tried everything. Uh, we did a lot of manual efforts, like meetups with local hosts. We, uh, we out, uh, did outreach to guests to actually convert them into hosts. Uh, we did a tremendous amount of referral campaigns. We also did uh, much more broader campaigns uh, targeted at very specific events. So instead of running ads, I would say, hey, make money on Airbnb, we'd say, hey, for Oktoberfest this weekend, you can make $2,000. It was a very actionable event for a host to take versus this amorphous, hey, make money. Uh, we also bootstrapped uh, the... Uh, we bootstrapped guaranteeing demand for the supply side by actually having a lot of the employees of Airbnb review uh, the properties themselves. Uh, a funny story, when I first got there, a lot of the reviews I saw of people who had reviewed listings at Airbnb were actually sitting around me. <laughs> and, and Junie, who was presenting earlier at Airbnb, uh, remembers that fondly as well. So the key takeaway for this lesson is really that no single, single technique uh, was to credit with Airbnb's success. Uh, it, the sum of all these strategies really got us there, and a lot of those were manual efforts. Uh, the second lesson is be willing to take risks to service your community. Uh, so just to give you a sense of time frame here, it was July 2011. Uh, in, within 48 hours after uh, somebody's home was trashed, uh, we hit the front page of the business section of the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Financial Times. Uh, it really felt like we had a crisis at the company. People were scrambling. Uh, Brian came to me uh, in the middle of the night, uh, and he said, we've got to solve this problem. We have to find insurance. Uh, I called 15 to 20 different underwriters. I was introduced to some board members of Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, nobody would underwrite us. Uh, so what did we do? Uh, we realized that the risk of doing too little 
was greater than the risk of, of doing too much. Uh, and uh, at 1 a.m. one evening, uh, I proposed, hey, why don't we self-insure uh, for $5,000? Uh, we didn't feel like that was meaningful enough. And so um, Brian said, hey, let's go bigger. And so, well, how about $50,000? That kind of scared everybody. Uh, I think I com computed the uh, potential um, risk around that. I think it was roughly $500 million of actual outsized exposure risk for a business that clearly did not have that much money. Uh, I braced myself for all the fraudulent claims that were going to come through the morning that we launched. And the reality was, it just didn't happen. Uh, the, the risk paid off. Uh, it was very well received in the market, both from quelling the fire from a press standpoint, but also really bringing trust within the community. And it became a cornerstone for um, our supply set in terms of bringing supply on board. And the real takeaway here is you can take extreme risks for your users when necessary. Uh, believe in the good of in people. We did, and it actually really worked out for us. Not always the worst case is going to happen. The, le the third lesson is when competition appears, move ridiculously fast. Uh, so this was uh, in the fall, roughly, of 2012. Uh, our competitor in Europe received $90 million in funding, had ramped up to 400 employees in two months, way more employees than we had. Uh, and they had scraped off all of the listings on our website and put them on their website. Uh, we needed to change tax it, tactics, go on an all-out blitz. Uh, first and foremost, though, meant that we had to be local in those markets, particularly in Europe, and we had no presence there. Uh, so with the logistics in hand from uh, the lessons learned around the 300 listings, 100 reviewed, uh, re what we really did was we did a blitz scaling in Europe. So we opened up uh, a handful of offices, uh, in Europe, we, uh, Brian always likes to say we hired missionaries, not mercenaries. Our competitors were very much mercenaries. Uh, they were kind of hired guns. Uh, so we tried to keep our hiring bar quite high around people who were really gravitated towards Airbnb, but we did hire fast. Uh, we also made a handful of small acquisitions to seed supply in some of those key markets. We did a huge PR campaign. Uh, I remember the slogan, uh, rent the country of Liechtenstein on Airbnb. I don't think you can do that anymore, but it actually was available for a handful of months back then. Uh, the pace might sound ridiculously fast. Uh, even the night before we launched our international sites, uh, we didn't even have translation. Uh, I was scrambling in the middle of the night with a team of translators trying to get it done. We got it done a few days later. Fortunately, not too many people uh, saw, saw that we didn't have it done. Uh, we definitely neglected a lot of operational challenges at this scale, though, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment, but I want to highlight that we actually left a lot of, side, a lot of things to the side during this time. And the key lesson here is that marketplaces are normally winner-take-all markets. Uh, if we'd lost ground in Europe, we may have never gotten it back, and so even though we may have done some very inefficient things, moved very, very fast, it was to our benefit uh, in the longer term. The fourth lesson is, uh, when it comes to edge cases, uh, understand your tipping point. Uh, so after we had faced all these challenges, we, uh, we were really starting to scale. We'd hit roughly 200,000 listings. Uh, but we started to have these edge cases in the product that were happening roughly 50 to 100 times a day. These edge cases could be anything from when you cancel, somebody manually would get back to you. When you'd want to rebook, somebody would manually get back to you. When you'd want to alter a reservation, we did not have that functionality. Uh, we deliberately kicked the can down the road for a lot of this work, but we realized that if we didn't solve it in the next 12 months, we were going to have to literally hire 1,000 people to manually solve these problems at the growth that we were, that we were hitting. The, uh, the other cost of this is that it wouldn't have just affected the bottom line. It would have also affected the complexity and the culture of the organization. Uh, hiring that many people is quite burdensome at this scale. And so we've quickly put a framework in place to solve edge cases. This is probably pretty common for many of you, but I'll just run through this. How often is this happening? How many users are impacted? How important is this to the user? Can manual efforts continue to address this? How many resources would it take to solve? Uh, can we leverage the work on the solution and apply it to other problems? So thinking about can it be applied more broadly? <clears throat> so what do we do to address, address edge cases? And, and when do you address them? Uh, well. Our rule of thumb was really, uh, at least my rule of thumb, uh, which, which I evangelized internally, was roughly something was happening 50 times a day. This is going to be different for other types of businesses. But for us, we realized if it was going to happen 50 times a day, if we were going to grow three, 300%, 600%, it was going to start to happen 150, 300 times a day. That was just completely unsustainable. Uh, 
What we also learned though is we solved a lot of these problems manually first and that was really great in terms of insight because when we did try to automate those solutions, we knew exactly what we were automating. And so it was advantageous for us to actually solve some of those problems manually first. <clears throat> so uh, complexity could be deafening So if, if you wait too long. So try to solve these, try to find that middle ground. And again, the key kind of takeaway here is there's always a struggle between growth and the mundane ma maintenance, uh, but keep an eye on this and figure out when you need to actually address them. Uh, the fifth lesson is when the fires are out, don't rest, focus on streamlining the user experience. Uh, so in 2014, uh, we were definitely moving away from a triage mode, much more into an optimization mode, uh, thank goodness. And uh, we really identified quickly that the biggest product issue uh, is when a guest would send a booking request and the host had to reply and commonly would not actually reply back at all. <clears throat> right now, you may not actually see that on Airbnb because we actually fixed this with the solution, uh, but it was a request to book model where the host would have to respond. And the worst thing in a marketplace is for somebody on the other side not to get back. Uh, it creates this false sense that nobody's actually in the marketplace. Uh, and it was a huge issue. Uh, we had this product called Instant Book, which was modeled after eBay's Buy Now, uh, which basically meant that when you would hit book an Airbnb, you would actually have a confirmed booking versus waiting for a host. The problem was it was a small feature and we'd never try to evangelize it or get anybody to adopt it and it had extraordinarily low usage. Uh, so, so first we needed to convince our host that uh, they should accept guests through Instant Book and that that would be safe. One is we <clears throat> excuse me, introduced Verified ID, which is uh, building a huge uh, up-leveling of trust on a platform through things like background checks, verified phone numbers, email addresses, um, um, having everybody's photo, a visible photo. As well, on the host side, we needed to do the really mundane task of actually making sure that they updated their calendar. If any of you have to deal with uh, users who have calendars, nobody ever wants to actually update them. Uh, and so we built out a whole mobile experience around hosts literally to just update their calendar, incentivize them through notifications to actually engage with the product. And through all of these efforts, we moved the instant book adoption rate from single digit percentage to over 50%. And the number is much, much higher even today. So the key takeaway here is that building something isn't always enough. Uh, you need to really understand the emotional and operational needs of your users to actually get the most out of the feature. This feature we had for several years and nobody used it. It took a huge effort for us to change other parts of the product, educate our users to actually start to use Instant Book. Uh, so these are really the five key lessons uh, for when I was at Airbnb. I'll just kind of review them uh, again. It's setting those super specific goals, taking risks to service your community. You got, really got to move fast against your competition when it comes. You got to understand those edge cases and actually when to address them. And you can't rest when all these fires and, and the triage is out. You actually have to move the business forward and start to optimize. Uh, it's where, uh, these inflection points are where I learned the most and it was the, the team at Airbnb that was very creative to actually come up with all of these solutions. So I'm happy to take, uh, take questions around uh, my time at Airbnb. Uh, and we can also uh, take questions uh, uh, around other topics, marketplace topics in general, but wanted to kind of showcase this here today. Yeah. On the uh, number third point, yeah. third point, number three point, uh, when, when you're dealing with your competitors in Europe, um, uh, yeah, I know you set up local shops there, so you kind of made that part of the sales game. How much of that was also a marketing game? Uh, you know, were you full blitzing with marketing spend, like just dumping marketing spend anywhere? Were you being super strategic? Yes, yeah, so we focused on eight key markets initially, and so we did target our marketing spend uh, in those key markets, and we definitely overspent. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and in a lot of those early days, people ask, you know, what what worked? Uh, kind of even going back to the, the first lesson, uh, it's hard to measure things at, at that time. I wish we did a better job of measuring. I'd probably be more crisp in my answers, but it was hard to to know actually what really did move the needle or not. Yeah, so uh, Airbnb uh, organizes international operations uh, quite differently than, than Uber, um, which has that classic kind of GM structure. Uh, for Airbnb, uh, a lot of the, uh, the teams um, 
in other markets were much more focused on supply acquisition, uh, and then as well government relations in those areas, and any more local uh, marketing efforts. And so in terms of the marketing in those other regions, there were much smaller marketing efforts. So for instance, when I talked about some of those promotional campaigns for very specifically targeted events, those would be driven by those local teams. But for any high level brand messaging, that was all driven out of, uh, out of HQ. Yeah, go for it. Yes, so you mentioned uh, that you were uh, in part relying on the goodness of people. Right? Yes. So in your career at, at Airbnb, do you notice a lot of fraud? Or, or how, how do you think about that? Or how should we think about you know, this kind sure. of Sure. So, so I have this kind of whole thesis around kind of behavior change. And, and people may think Airbnb was crazy. And nobody thinks of that today. Um, you know, maybe people thought everybody was crazy to get on scooters two years ago. It seems like people are kind of on scooters today. You know, could be wrong. but. Uh, in terms of uh, fraud and, and risk, uh, on Airbnb, honestly, most people really were good. Um, the, the host guarantee and, and seeing uh, how that played out was a prime example of that. Uh, the, the messages we, we'd get back were uh, normally when the guests and hosts disagreed about some broader issue, and then the host thought the guest stole his jacket. You know, so they were very, it was almost like petty, petty bickering. Right, in a sense. And so those are actually the majority of the cases. You know, the, for some reason, the two parties just didn't get along. And the, the, the one side ascribed some event to the other side, which may or may not have happened. You know, and in, the, in that situation, it was easy for Airbnb to kind of absorb that and bring trust uh, back into the community. Yeah. So you mentioned um, that when you were out trying to get that magic number of listings. Yeah. That's right. Anywhere in the city, or was there very specific neighborhoods at very specific pricing? Uh, was there more to that, or was it just kind of 300 overall in the city? So it was uh, 300 in a market, and how Airbnb defined a market was a city. So, and the reason why we define it as a city is because the normal experience for a user would be I'm going to go to Paris, I want to go to New York. Um, if the normal experience happened to be, I want to go to a specific neighborhood and that's how everybody traveled, that's probably how we would have defined a market and we would have probably come up with another metric. Um, for instance, with Uber and Lyft, I'm sure um, the market was probably roughly city specific as well. Um, but the uh, inflection point for the supply was probably around lead time of how fast a car would arrive for an average person in that city or market. Right? And so their number is probably not going to be 300, but it's going to be some number where suddenly the lead time dropped to a certain level where demand just kind of exploded because suddenly I don't have to wait for a car for 25 minutes, I have to wait for a car for seven minutes. The difference between waiting for a car for seven minutes and two minutes probably isn't nearly as great as the difference between 25 to seven minutes. Again, I don't know the specifics, but as a parallel example. Yeah. Sure. So uh, I got this question earl earlier today. Uh, I think a lot of marketplaces are moving uh, much more into a, a managed marketplace model. Uh, if you looked at the, uh, if you heard the VC panel up here earlier today, they talked about asset light and asset heavy. I still am a believer in asset light marketplaces. So being more managed doesn't mean you're asset heavy, but it does mean you may get more involved. And so bringing more trust into the marketplace, bring more identity in, but also providing the supply with potentially more economies of scale. Potentially the marketplace can have actually service the supply set in a, in a better way. For instance, maybe they're providing financing. Uh, and they can get financing, and those individual uh, on the supply side, they could have never gotten financing themselves. Maybe that mar the supply side is using materials. Maybe the marketplace can actually order materials at a, at a larger scale and actually get lower pricing, and then those individual suppliers can actually go get that uh, at a lower price point. So that all facilitates more transactions on the marketplace. So I'm seeing more of those um, as, as one example. Yeah. Yeah, so we didn't do that much cheering. Uh, I think right now there's an effort with Airbnb, particularly on the supply side, to tier more. And so they're uh, trying to create uh, uh, certain categories of listings because there are now so many. <clears throat> Airbnb's early days of tiering were much more around uh, a preference towards what we would call super hosts, which was trying to um, really showcase hosts who were exceptional. 
probably the biggest form of Turing was actually algorithmic Turing, which is when we showed supply uh, in the listings page, we showed that supply based on likelihood to book. And so uh, if somebody was a good host, they're naturally going to pop up more uh, on that search page. Mm -hmm. So two questions is, do you think, one, Airbnb should have brought up DMR earlier? And second, like, what did the organization look like before you did? Sure. I, I, you know, I, uh, I targeted Airbnb to try to be the first PM. Uh, I, I wrote the job rack. I, I think they hired me at the exact right time. <laughs> um, they had roughly eight engineers at the time. Uh, I do think it's, it's that classic example of when um, the founders are involved in, in the product and they're now being taken away from the product. And they need more people to, to do that work. In addition, the engineering team is expanding in such a way that it's starting to have uh, a harder time to keep track of what everybody's doing. And somebody even building just the beginning basic roadmaps of what everybody's even working on becomes beneficial. And so that, that's my experience is when it makes sense to start to introduce product. Any earlier than that, and it may be, uh, may be disruptive uh, because the core team is, is so intertwined. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I think um, we probably could have done some of the operational stuff even sooner. Uh, those edge cases really got, um, got intense, uh, and there was a lot of cleanup uh, to take on. Um, I think that when we expanded internationally, there was a lot of cleanup afterwards that we had to address. Um, in hindsight, yeah, but, it, you know, if you were to have over-biased on one side, I actually recommend over-biasing on, on the sides that we did, right? So it was really the things that I, I wish we did different were the ramifications of that, but I wouldn't have, have actually changed those actions. Uh, last question. Sure. So, so all of that ended up being factored in, and ultimately we ended up using a machine learning model, and we got to that place where it, it became something that I couldn't describe to you. Uh, what we did do, though, is if you were a, a new host, we would obviously bump you up to make sure you had some visibility and you weren't relegated to, to the back. And so we did make sure that we did some more ma manualization adjustments such that we, we allowed newcomers to actually uh, get business as well. Okay, thanks so much for everyone's time.